Welcome to our continuing conversations around central ideas of and important questions about student growth percentiles or SGPs. And we're going to deal with, in some ways, a very straightforward and important question of why do we need SGPs? Why do we need these to measure growth? Well, I want to unpack for you a statement made by Dr. Damien Biedebender, who was the creator of the SGP model. It's a simple, short phrase of six words, but I think couched within these six words are some powerful insights. Because what Dr. Biedebender has said is subtraction is not a growth model. Let me explain to you what he's talking about. He's referencing how we have historically measured growth, which was primarily through a pre-test, post-test model. Have a student take a test. Some period later, they take another test. Compare the pre-test score to the post-test score. Subtract the difference. Find out how much they've grown by saying what is the difference between those two scores. There are a couple of problems with using this model uh, that need to be addressed. And one is, first of all, in using this model, you are relying upon scores, for example, percentile ranks and normal curved equivalents. Uh, you are relying upon scores that are designed to rank performance not designed expressly to quantify growth. And perhaps even more importantly, the basic calculation involved in this model, which is simple subtraction, it does not account for many other relevant factors that should be considered when you're trying to say something definitive about how a student has grown. So let's dive into this a little bit. What would some of those relevant factors that need to be considered, what, what would those things be? Well, one we've talked about previously, which is the concept of academic peers. Uh, if you simply subtract the differences between two, you might be finding the absolute difference between a student in the top 10% of performance and the top student in the bottom in the bottom 10% or, or someone in the middle, and those are not necessarily appropriate direct comparisons. So as we previously talked about, it makes better sense to compare top performing kids to top performing kids and lower performing kids to lower performing kids. You get the most reasonable and the most accurate comparison by, by doing that type of an approach. But there's other elements beyond that. And one has a pretty scary name, regression to the mean, but don't panic. It's actually a fairly simple concept. What regression to the mean says, or what it is, is, is it's a statistical phenomenon, and it's inherent to all tests, not just star tests. And I think that this image here is a very good way to think about regression to the mean. So you see that shape that's common to most of us or familiar to us. It's the shape of the normal curve distribution. But then take a look within there. Of course, you've got the mean score in the center. And regression to the mean is reflected by those arrows that point towards the center. And the reason that I believe that this image really does capture the concept of regression to the mean is because that's exactly what it is. It is the phenomenon that over time, test takers will sometimes experience instances where they have more normal scores. And in this sense, what that means is if you're a low performing student, a more normal score would be something closer to the mean. And if you're a high performing student, it's something closer to the mean. So for a high performing student, every now and then they're going to get a lower score and then bounce right back up. And for a low performing student, every now and then they get a little bit higher score and then they fall back down again. This again is a phenomenon that is inherent to all tests. Well, SGP calculations, the formula actually bakes in a consideration of regression to the mean. And let me illustrate to you why that is so important. Now, I've used this image before. These are some of the exact calculations around SGP. And for those of you that really understand statistics and psychometrics, you could go through the formula and you could find the elements where regression to the mean is considered. But let me explain to you why it is so critical that we also consider regression to the mean. I'm going to do this by using an example of a student named Diego. He's a very, very high performing student. 
In the fall, he took a star test for you, and he had a percentile rank of 95, way up there in terms of the performance. So let's suppose that Diego in the fall has a percentile rank of 95, and in the winter, you are shocked to see that when Diego sits down and takes a star test for you, he has a percentile rank of 84. Now remember, our historical approach would be to look at the pretest and look at the post test, explore the difference between the two, and, and we would be very alarmed because by using a pretest post test model, we would say Diego has lost ground. He has moved backwards. He's dropped nine percentile points. Well, is that actually the case? Has Diego actually gone back or has Diego experienced regression to the mean, where high-performing students, in, the, in his example, might have a more normal, in, in the case for him, a lower score? Is this a true dip on Diego's part, or is this just a fluctuation in his score because of regression to the mean? And that's exactly what the SGP formula says or asks. It notes Diego is a high-performing student. That makes him extremely exposed to regression to the mean. How much fluctuation in scores do students like Diego have uh, or experience as part of regression to the mean? And is the change that we are looking at uh, in the case of Diego's score, uh, is this something within that type of fluctuation that a high-performing student have, or is it something beyond that? In other words, has he truly dropped or is he just experience a fluctuation because of regression to the mean? So if we only had the scale scores and the percentile ranks, we could not answer that question. But if we know that in the fall, he has a 95 percentile rank, and in the winter, he achieves a 94, but we look at his SGP and it's fairly solid, then what we say is, okay, it's probably not the case that Diego has slid all that much. This drop that we perceive, this change in his percentile rank, is really just a manifestation of regression to the mean. In this sense, what the SGP model does is it gives you some additional context against so that you understand whether this is a true drop or whether this is a score fluctuation that we can account for through considerations of regression to the mean. If, on the other hand, Diego had a 95 and then had an 84 in the winter, and we saw a low SGP, something like a 24, then we would have cause to be concerned, and we would perceive his drop as something that is very precipitous, not within the normal ranges. But again, the SGP provides that context that lets you know whether this change is something that is fairly normal or fairly typical, or whether the change in score is something that should be of tremendous concern. The important point is then that the SGP model is far more comprehensive than our more historical and simple pre-test and post-test models, making it a superior way to evaluate growth.